Welcome to our Good Friday devotion, a time spent together thinking about that last hour that Jesus spent on the cross, on which Christians believe he died to bring the world back into relationship with a loving and merciful God. My name is Sarah and I am joined by Ian and we're going to spend the next hour focusing on the cross, listening to God's word, having some quiet time together, reflecting and praying for ourselves, those we love, the church and the world. So we begin with a short time of silence, giving thanks for the cross, a place where brokenness became whole, pain became peace, and death becomes life. So let us pray. Eternal God, in the cross of Jesus, we see the cost of our sin and the depth of your love. In humble hope and fear, may we place at his feet all that we have and all that we are. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah, beginning to read at chapter 52, verse 13. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told, them they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days, 
Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, made intercession for the transgressors. So we now listen to another translation of the same reading from Isaiah, Isaiah 52 and 53, written by Eugene Peterson from his Message Bible. Who believes what we've heard and seen? Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over. A man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was filth. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We've all been like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him, on him. He was beaten. He was tortured. But he didn't say a word like a lamb taken to be slaughtered and like a sheep being sheared. He took it all in silence. Justice miscarried and he was led off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, beaten for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man. Even though he never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Out of that terrible travail of soul, he'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous ones, as he himself carries the burden of their sins. Therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly the best of everything, the highest honours, because he looked death in the face and didn't flinch, because he embraced the company of the lowest. He took on his own shoulders the sin of many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep.
we listen to words from Psalm 22. A psalm that speaks of suffering. A psalm that is a plea for deliverance. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me on the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved, in you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord let him deliver, let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. And we're now going to hear the poem Good Friday by Christina Rossetti. And in this poem, Rossetti uses images from the Exodus of Moses striking the rock and water pouring forth. And she offers those in conjunction with her reflections on the crucifixion. She offers us a chance to reflect on grief, on grace, on future life and on abundance. And I'm going to read the poem twice. And if you would like to share any reflections, any thoughts, then please do so in the box below. Or you can quietly to reflect to yourself or maybe write a note or two. So I first, for the first time, I read the poem Good Friday by Christina Rossetti. Am I a stone? and not a sheep that I can stand, O Christ, beneath thy cross, to number drop by drop thy blood's slow loss, and yet not weep. Not so those women loved, who with exceeding grief lamented thee. Not so fallen Peter, weeping bitterly. Not so the thief was moved. Not so the sun and moon which hid their faces in a starless sky. A horror of great darkness at broad noon. I, only I. Yet give not all, but seek thy shepherd, thy sheep true shepherd of the flock. Greater than Moses, turn and look once more and smite a rock. So I wonder what image or words jump out at you this afternoon. Which character in the poem do you feel most drawn to? Perhaps the grieving women. Perhaps Peter, wretched in his realisation that he has denied Christ. Perhaps the thief who asked Jesus to remember him. A moment of quiet and I'll read the poem again. Am I a stone, and not a sheep, that I can stand, O Christ, beneath thy cross, 
to number drop by drop thy blood's slow loss, and yet not weep. Not so those women loved, who with exceeding grief lamented thee. Not so fallen Peter, weeping bitterly. Not so the thief was moved. Not so the sun and moon which hid their faces in a starless sky. A horror of great darkness at broad noon. I, only I. Yet give not all, but seek thy sheep, true shepherd of the flock. Greater than Moses, turn and look once more. And smite a rock. Sarah will now read from the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, beginning to read at verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke good one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We now spend some time in silent reflection, after which Ian is going to read the Passion of Jesus according to the Gospel of John. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across, across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? 
they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfil the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters, so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfil what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and said, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But, as it is, 
My kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to, fest to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's ben bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but... This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, 
but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfil what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfil the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath, Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might, bo might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Away with him, away with him. We have no king but the emperor. Words we hear in the Passion reading from the Gospel of John today. The story of Jesus' trial, death and burial, read so beautifully by Ian. How could the people have missed it? How could they not have realised that before them stood the Messiah, God with us here on earth, the one that the prophets spoke of? It's all too easy, or at least it is for me, perhaps, to assume that I would have got it. I would have been amongst the small group of people who stayed with Jesus to the end. 
that even though I find it hard to think about, I sometimes wonder. I wonder which group I would have been with. Could I have been one who raised my voice with the many others and yelled, crucify him, crucify him. The reality of the servant king, crucified and vulnerable, is at such odds with our human understanding of what a king should be. This is as true today as it was then. Jesus and Tiberius, the emperor who ruled at the time when Jesus was alive, they made a very stark contrast. The emperor Tiberius was one of the greatest Roman generals. He expanded the Roman Empire during his reign, conquering huge areas of Europe. He laid the foundations for the northern Roman frontier. And it's true that to have Roman citizenship was something that many took great pride in. It gave you status and certain legal rights. Jesus of Nazareth had made no military conquests. He hadn't overthrown the Romans, as perhaps the Messiah was supposed to do. He hadn't heralded in a new era of freedom and prosperity for Israel. It's true that people had seen him perform great miracles, and stories about these miracles and his teaching had been spreading. However, to proclaim that you were a follower of Jesus was downright dangerous, as Peter knew only too well denying Christ three times because of the fear of knowing what may happen to him. And I often wonder if Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, was motivated by disappointment. There is an incident recorded in the Bible when Mary, a follower of Jesus, poured expensive perfume on his feet. Judas challenges her, saying that such an action was wasteful. That money, he said, could have been given to the poor. You might imagine that Jesus, in his compassion for the vulnerable, would have agreed with Judas. But instead, Jesus affirmed Mary or the unnamed woman's actions, saying that his followers will have many opportunities to help the poor. But this woman's actions were wholly good and right, an act of anointing and care, pointing to Jesus's imminent death. And I wonder how Judas felt about being spoken to in such a way. And I wonder if at that point his disappointment meant that he started to question Jesus' motivations and teachings. Who knows? However, what we do know is that Christianity is completely countercultural. It turns expectations, assumptions, those things we take for granted upside down. It challenges much that society teaches us. It pushes us out of our comfort zones and it opens a completely new vista. When someone first comes to faith, it can be completely life-changing and amazing. It can be a time of great joy and celebration and excitement. However, it can also be disorientating. Those things that may have given identity and security, these may have changed. And I think we notice this more when things around us become more difficult. At times of great stress, like the days we are living through right now, we look for things to cling on to, to give us a sense of security and safety. And we push away those things that seem irrelevant, confusing and disappointing. It's easy, isn't it, to cling on to those things that the world gives us? Because often they give us immediate satisfaction, comfort or assurance. It's a lot harder to cling on to the cross of Jesus, which as his disciples is our calling, each and every one of us. So this Good Friday, as we contemplate the cross once more, let us claim the only security worth having, the only identity in which we fully become ourselves, and find a relationship with God that can transform both this life and the next. Amen. You now listen to a poem written by Malcolm Guite that speaks of the power of the cross. See, as they strip the robe from off his back and spread his arms and nail them to the cross, the dark nails pierce him and the sky turns black and love is firmly fastened onto loss. But here a pure change happens on this tree Loss becomes gain, 
death opens into birth. Here wounding heals and fastening makes free. Earth breathes in heaven, heaven roots in earth. And here we see the length, the breadth, the height, where love and hatred meet and love stays true. Where sin meets grace and darkness turns to light. We see what love can bear and be and do. And here our Saviour calls us to his side. His love is free, his arms are open wide. Again, feel free to share your thoughts below. Or maybe reflect on some of those words you have heard quietly to yourselves. With some questions that might help you reflect. What image has come to mind when you just listened to that poem? Ian is going to read it again in a minute. What does the cross mean to you this Good Friday? So Ian is now going to read the poem once more. See, as they strip the robe from off his back and spread his arms and nail them to the cross. The dark nails pierce him and the sky turns black. And love is firmly fastened onto loss. But here a pure change happens on this tree. Loss becomes gain, death opens into birth. Here wounding heals and fastening makes free. Earth breathes in heaven, heaven roots in earth. And here we see the length, the breadth, the height, where love and hatred meet and love stays true. Where sin meets grace and darkness turns to light, we see what love can bear and be and do. And here our Saviour calls us to his side. His love is free. His arms are open wide. So let us pray. And if you have a prayer, rest, prayer request today, uh, please do type it below. Um, if we don't have the opportunity to pray during the service, be assured that we will pray at the end. Let us pray to our loving God. Let us pray for the Church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness, and in service, for bishops and other ministers, and those whom they serve, for Rachel and Robert our bishops, for all people in this place, for those to be baptised, and for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith. Bind all who follow you together in the love and peace that passes all understanding. Let us pray for the nations of the world and their leaders, for Elizabeth our Queen, and our Parliament, and for all who work for justice and to help those who are vulnerable. 
we pray that with God's help the world may live in peace and freedom. Let us pray for those who do not believe the gospel of Christ, for those who have not heard the message of salvation, for all who have lost faith, for the hurting and for the angry. We pray that they may hear the good news of the gospel and know that they are loved as your beloved children. So let us pray for all who suffer, for those who have recently lost their jobs, for those who feel unsafe at home, for those who are unwell in body, mind or spirit, but especially those who are suffering from COVID-19 at this time. Lord, we give thanks for those who care for them, protect them and surround them with the love and grace and assurance of knowing that you walk with them. We pray too for those in darkness, in doubt and in despair, in loneliness and in fear, for prisoners, captives and refugees, for the victims of false accusations and violence, for all at the point of death and to those who care for them and for those who are unable to be with them that God's grace will sustain them with the knowledge of that love that never fails We remember the families of those who have died recently and those whose anniversaries occur at this time. May they know the comfort, the promise won for us all on the cross, that all who follow you will come to the fullness of eternal life. We offer these and all our prayers to God in the words our Saviour taught us to pray. So let us pray together. Our, our Father, Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So some words 
from a very familiar hymn that we will listen to in a short while. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I can't but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God, or the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See, from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. So let us pray. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.